This is your PowerPoint for the PowerPoint quiz on civil rights in modern times. So what we're going to do in this PowerPoint is try and take the civil rights movement from where it was back in the 1960s and bring it up to the present and take a look at what are some of the big issues that are facing the civil rights movement at this point in time and what are some of the different interpretations that people have at this time. And what I'm really going to make a big argument for is that we're really stuck right now in two possible ways of looking at the civil rights movement. One way is a more conservative way of looking at the issue that talks more about the need for strong families, strong personal responsibility, a breakdown of dependency upon the government, and the need for individuals within different uh, minority groups to assimilate into the society, but to assimilate in a way that allows them to participate in the free market. On the other side, you have liberals, and liberals make the argument, generally speaking, that the problem for minorities today has to do with social inequalities, that over time, because of the different uh, d forms of discrimination and racism and, and the different types of relationships that have happened, there have been effects that have basically led to inequalities in society and that these inequalities play themselves out not only in the marketplace but also in the attitudes that we have to one another that oftentimes are not clear in the way that we relate to each other on the surface. So first off in the 1960s, in the 1960s there were a series of race riots that took place. In 1965, riots occurred in some of the major cities across the country, including places like Los Angeles and Watts and Newark. The major complaints of these race riots was that as the civil rights movement moved up into the north, up into the urban area, they noticed that there were these huge problems that African Americans were facing within the inner city, like poor housing, police brutality, and underfunded schools. In fact, at one point, Lyndon Johnson who created a commission in order to study uh, these issues said, you know, this was the problem of the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement had raised expectations for people because Martin Luther King had been so successful in getting rid of so many of the segregationist laws that had taken place. Lyndon Johnson claimed that all of a sudden now expectations have been raised so fast amongst the African-American community that there was this real feeling that things had to change immediately in order to get rid of a lot of the economic and social inequalities that existed. This leads up to the election of 1968. 1968, Richard Nixon runs for the Republican side of the race under what he called law and order. And when he said law and order, a lot of people thought, okay, law and order means he wants to reduce crime, he wants to provide safety in the streets. But in many ways, it really was coded language. People understood in 1968 what law and order meant. Law and order really meant the need to calm down these race riots that were taking place within so many of the cities. And at the time, the Democrats had split themselves between three candidates, Hubert Humphrey, Robert Kennedy, and Eugene McCarthy. That eventually allowed for Richard Nixon to win. But what's really going to be important is a fourth person that's running, not so much on the Democratic side, although originally he was a Democrat, but he's going to break off and form what he called the Independent Party, and that is George Wallace. Uh, George Wallace was originally a governor from the South in Arkansas. He was a segregationist governor. At this point, Wallace does not run an explicitly racist campaign, but rather he runs a coded campaign. He talks about how America is being stolen. He talks about how the working class is losing its place. He talks about how there's these other groups that are starting to steal away what the working class had worked so hard for. And what George Wallace was really doing was he was appealing to the Southern white voter. He was basically making an argument that the Southern white voter was starting to see the tables turning, that minorities were somehow stealing away their identity. Because of this, there's eventually a fear on the Republican side. And the fear on the Republican side is that George Wallace would eventually split the South. Wallace originally was a Democrat, but he becomes an independent. And the fear is, is that when Wallace runs for the presidency, if he does this again in 1972, which he was going to do this, uh, that Wallace would split the South. And if Nixon tried to run a, a campaign again, that Nixon would only win so much of the South and he wouldn't be able to become president. So there's this guy named Kevin Phillips, who's an advisor to Nixon, and he argues that Nixon should start appealing to Southern whites. In fact, at one point, Nixon and Kevin Phillips actually take George Wallace into a back room and they talk to him about how they're going to appeal to his issues if he will just drop out and not run in the next race. And that eventually happens. This strategy that Kevin Phillips comes up with is called the Southern Strategy. And the idea of the Southern Strategy was to draw away traditional Democrats from the party in the South and move them over into the Republican Party. What Nixon used was a number of race-baiting languages in order to try to, through coded language, kind of get people to vote for Republicans. Like, for example, one of the biggest issues was forced busing. Nixon criticized at the time the Supreme Court case in Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg, which said that the only way that truly integrated education was going to take place was through forced busing. Well, what does this mean? So integration sounds like a really good idea, but the problem is, is that you had demographic segregation. Now, when I say demographic segregation, I don't mean the old Jim Crow laws. 
What I mean is, is that people tended to live on different parts of the city due to economics. So in any city that you looked at, you might see, for example, a large white part of the population living on one part of the city, a large black part of the population living on the other side of the city. Well, how are you going to have integration take place? I mean, even though segregation is no longer by law, you really can't have people integrated unless you start moving people around into different areas. And so that's what happened. In a lot of cities, they started doing forced busing, meaning students were bused from one side of the city over the other side of the city to try to integrate schools. Nixon criticized this, and at the time, he offered a criticism that this led into so many problems between the different communities. But now we kind of know that this goes back to Kevin Phillips' strategy. By criticizing the issue of busing, what they were really criticizing was the issue of civil rights. So Nixon was a conservative for his time, which actually is, is kind of interesting because for his time period, while Nixon was conservative today, he might actually be considered a liberal. Now, how can I say something like that? Well, Nixon actually favored a number of like the ma of major new types of government programs. For example, Nixon at the time wanted to end welfare, but to provide for what was called a national income for poor people. He also established the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, that provides for major regulations for the environment and he favored the first major affirmative action plan for the philadelphia project this would mean that the government would actually go out and it would make sure that it provided a quota or a certain amount of jobs for minorities in the area to try to provide for equality so what is nixon after here why is he doing all these things that really in many ways sound extremely liberal well it seems like nixon had two strategies going on he had sort of a southern strategy and a northern strategy the southern strategy seems to be to use coded language to win over conservative voters from the South, while at the same time in the northern cities, he seems to be appealing to the middle class in every single group. So for example, by providing a baseline national income for poor people, he was going to end welfare, middle class people like that, because that means that you won't have people dependent upon welfare, but he was also helping the poor, middle class people like that as well. Middle class people tend to be very uh, interested in protecting the environment, Environmental Protection Agency. And who does the affirmative action usually help. Well, it actually tends to help people in the middle class, African Americans and women in the middle class, because these are the people who are starting to rise up in society and making sure that it provides jobs for them. So it seems like Nixon is trying two different things here, appealing to the Southerners, while at the same time appealing to the middle class up in the North. So what about affirmative action? Affirmative action is actually one of the big issues that's very controversial during this time period when it comes to race. Advocates of affirmative action had argued that due to 100 years of slavery and then 75 years of segregation, there were massive inequalities that had been formed in society, and that maybe affirmative action was the best way to provide a proactive way to rectify these inequalities. Basically, the idea was colleges and jobs would go out and they would attempt to establish quotas in which they would say, okay, we're going to hire a certain number of minorities to try and rectify the past and try to make sure that we have enough people in our jobs from a diversity of backgrounds. This led to a very important case called Bakke versus Regents of California. Bakke had been rejected from the UC Davis Medical School. He actually had pretty low grades and overall low scores on the MCAT in comparison to the general pool of applicants. But basically what happened was there were 100 spots open. The first 90 were open to everybody. Anybody could apply, anybody could compete. The last 10 were open primarily to minorities in order to rectify problems from the past. Bakke basically scored in such a way that he couldn't get into the top 90, and because he was white, could not then get into the, to the bottom 10. His argument was that because he couldn't get into that bottom 10, he had been discriminated against. He called it reverse racism. And so eventually what ended up happening was this went to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court actually ended up arguing a very controversial decision. They said that Bakke was right, that the regents of California had acted unconstitutionally. But... Not that affirmative action was unconstitutional. Okay, how could they argue this? What they argued, the Supreme Court basically argued, look, you can't establish strict quotas because eventually that's going to lead into a racial decision. Even if you have the best of intentions, you are eventually making a decision based upon race if you establish a quota. So you can't do this 90-10 issue. But what you can do is that you can use race as a factor. In other words, when you're thinking about all the issues that society has to face, a college can make a decision that an African-American kid, a Latino kid, a white kid, an Asian kid, whatever, that could be a part of the overall profile in trying to determine how much diversity you want to have on your campus.
The other big issue for the time period had to do with the Los Angeles Police Department. From 1979 to 1982, the chief of police was a man named Darrow Gates. He had instituted the SWAT teams in order to tackle the problem of the drug war, and this was sort of like the beginning of the militarization of the police. In 1991, the Christopher Commission found that these SWAT teams, or these militarized teams, had actually caused problems of excessive policing. And they found that there were a number of people who were complaining that there, there had been major abuses in Los Angeles, but that there hadn't really been a follow-up in order to solve these problems. This then leads into the case right before we're going to see a major explosion within Los Angeles, and it's the Latasha Harlan's case. In 1991, the tension was extremely high within Los Angeles, especially in downtown LA between African Americans and Korean shop owners. Latasha Harlan's was a young African American teenager, and she went into a Korean-owned store owned by um, a woman named Soon Ja Du. Du thought at the time that Harlan's was trying to steal uh, a bottle of orange juice. And the two ended up getting into a fight when Dew basically accused Harlan's of doing this. Harlan's basically slapped Dew across the face and started to walk out of the store. And as she did that, Dew reached below um, the counter of her shop. It took out a gun and shot Harlan's in the back. Dew was eventually found guilty of manslaughter by a jury, but the judge at the time, a woman named Judge Judy Carlin, ended up giving Dew a very light sentence and calling her reaction understandable, given the mitigating circumstances of the fight between Latasha Harlins and Dew. All of this had basically created so much tension within Los Angeles between the issues between the police and then what happened with Latasha Harlins. In 1991, Rodney King was being chased in the San Fernando Valley. Police officers eventually caught up to him in Simi Valley, and they were caught on videotape beating King incessantly. The first court case that took, case, took place on this took place in Simi Valley, which tended to be mostly white and very pro-police. And people saw how the police officers had beaten up on Rodney King on videotape. And you got to understand, today this is so easy for us to see because of YouTube and because of our ability with smartphones. But back then, this was really new for somebody to be able to capture on videotape exactly what was happening. When this was portrayed everywhere, it led to extreme suspicion towards the police officers. And then eventually the police officers were acquitted. And that led to citywide riots and a fear that African Americans were not being given equal treatment. Now, another big issue that would be faced during this time period that directly ties into the issue of policing is the drug war. In the 1970s, Richard Nixon established a drug war, and the attempt at the time was to fight both demand at home with drugs and supply abroad through security measures. During the 1980s, crack cocaine became the, the major drug product that was being delivered into the urban centers in the 1980s, and it led to a desire amongst a lot of different groups of people for greater police security in order to protect local citizens and really to get rid of gangs that seemed to be thriving off of this crack cocaine epidemic. And this eventually led into a new type of policing theory that was practiced in the 1980s. It was called the broken windows theory. So the idea of the broken windows theory started off in New York. And here's the idea. The idea was if we really want to stop crime, especially the crime that we're seeing attached to the issue of, of the crack of cocaine epidemic, we need to attack small acts of crime. This is going to send a moral message to criminals that any type of crime is going to be serious. So the idea here is this. If somebody's walking down the street and they jaywalk, or if somebody's walking down the street and they spit on the ground, or if somebody's walking down the street and they do graffiti, it doesn't matter how small the crime is, or even littering, you've got to crack down on these small acts of crime, because by doing that, you send out a message to the community that if we're going to crack down on these small acts of crime, you better bet we're going to crack down on the big acts of crime. Well, this eventually led into this theory, led into the an application. And the application was, we need to have these strong policing units that are going to apply this broken windows theory. And they were known as the special units. For example, the Rampart Division in Los Angeles was founded in order to be one of these sort of like militarized units. But then all of a sudden, in the early 1990s to mid-1990s, it came out that a large number of the people had been given so much power in the Rampart Division that they were guilty of ties to gangs, murders, and police brutality. In 1997, a man named Abner Luima was arrested, and he was found to have been sodomized by the police with a broomstick. In 1999, Amadou Diallo um, was a Haitian immigrant, and while he was standing outside one night, he saw the police coming up and was so scared because he'd heard about these special units, he started to go into his apartment complex, and when the police stopped to come after him, he then got extremely scared because he was an immigrant. He turned around to reach into his pocket, and the police opened up fire and ended up shooting 41 times at him and killing him. It turned out at the end of this that when they pulled his hand out of his pocket, Amadou Diallo was reaching for his wallet.
So eventually we get then up to the Obama time period and all of these things have kind of come together, the police brutality issues, the LA riots, the special units, and there was a desire to look into this and try and solve this problem. In 2009, when Obama had gotten elected, a Harvard professor named Henry Louis Gates was arrested outside of his house by Lieutenant James Crowley. What had happened was Henry Louis Gates, who was a Harvard professor, was trying to get into his house and people called and, and said, there's this strange guy who's trying to get into his house and we uh, trying to get into his house and we don't know why. So Lieutenant James Crowley came and was trying to talk to Henry Louis Gates. And you can imagine Henry Louis Gates got pretty agitated because here he was trying to get into his own house. Lieutenant James Crowley, on the other hand, had been called to find out why this man was having a hard time getting into the house. Well, it ended up leading into an argument between the two and Lieutenant James Crowley eventually arrested the professor. President Obama came out at the time and said the police had acted stupidly. But when the commission went out and studied this, what they found is that both men really had kind of ratcheted up tensions between each other and could have been a lot less of the tensions. And so Obama ended up holding what was called the White House Beer Summit, where he invited both of these men to come and they had this big conversation about race and about policing. But this was only the beginning because what was about to happen really triggered a lot of the anger that had been welling up for so many decades about the issue of policing. And that was the Trayvon Martin case. In 2012, George Zimmerman, who was basically a, a guy who lived in an apartment complex, followed what he believed to be an intruder in his gated community. Now, when he was doing that, there had been a lot of crime within this gated community, and George Zimmerman thought that he was just following another kid who might be involved in this crime. And so he eventually went up to this kid named Trayvon Martin. And at that point, we don't know exactly what happened. What we do know is this. We know that George Zimmerman was asked by the police over the telephone not to follow after Trayvon Martin. Why? Well, because they kind of know that it's, it's better for the police who have at least a little bit better training in order to deal with these situations. Zimmerman, though, at one point said that he was going to follow Trayvon Martin because so many of these kids had done so many problems within the apartment complex. Well, we don't know exactly what happened between these two uh, when they came up against each other. What we do know is that they eventually got into a fight. And by the end of the fight, Zimmerman ended up shooting Martin. Zimmerman claimed that he had a right to do this under something that was called the Stand Your Ground Defense. The Stand Your Ground Defense was basically an argument at the time that if you were being attacked by somebody, you didn't have to run away. You could stand your ground and you could fight back against them. Eventually, Zimmerman was exonerated on the basis of self-defense. But the anger that came out of this, especially amongst black leaders, was that Trayvon Martin had was being stereotyped. When Zimmerman approached Trayvon Martin, Zimmerman believed that Martin was probably going to be guilty of some kind of crime. What did it turn out? Well, it turned out that Trayvon Martin basically was carrying iced tea and a box of Skittles. And he was at this apartment complex because his father was there and his father and mother had divorced. And so he was spending some time with his father over the weekend and unfortunately ended up in this horrible, uh, horrible argument with Zimmerman. This then escalated even more in 2014 when Michael Brown was suspected of having stolen cigarettes from a local store. There was an officer named Darren Wilson who pulled him over um, as he was walking across the street. He pulled him over to the side of the road and he got into a, a fight with him. And again, we don't know exactly what happened, but we do know that Officer Wilson's gun went off. Michael Brown then ran, and when Officer Wilson got out of his car, he ended up shooting Michael Brown. Now, by the end of this, Darren Wilson was exonerated. He was found by a grand, grand jury to have acted out of self-defense. But what's interesting is the exact same grand jury, the exact same DOJ also did a separate report in which they found that while it is true that Wilson acted out of self-defense, the Ferguson Police Department had been targeting black people in order to raise city funds. A large report that they put out both with stories and with direct quotes in which it turned out that the local um, city officials had been targeting local black people in order to raise funds for their city. Just to give you one example of what, the, give you two examples of how this was the case. Black people in Ferguson tended to be pulled over and have their cars searched more than white people, while white people had more contraband in their cars. Or take this one. Out of the 21,000 black residents of Ferguson, 16,000 of them had outstanding warrants issued for them by the courts. DOJ basically said there was some type of systematic racism occurring within the police department here. And then in 2014, 2015, there were just a number of cases that came across the television in which police abuse seemed to be targeting over and over again with minorities. 2014, Eric Garner was confronted by police officers for selling, 
for selling cigarettes. During this confrontation and scuffle, the police ended up using a chokehold that really they were not allowed to use by police rules, and it ended up leading to Eric Garner basically suffocating to death. 2014, Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old uh, black African-American teenager, uh, was basically playing in the park with a pellet gun, and the police were called because people feared that he might, it might be a real gun. And when they showed up, um, they parked pretty far away, got out of their car, and before Rice had a chance to really understand what was going on, the police shot and ended up killing Tamir Rice. 2015, Sandra Bland, an African-American woman, was pulled over for a routine traffic violation and began arguing with the police officer. And so she was eventually taken in. And then three days later, she was found in the prison having committed suicide. And then in 2015, the big case that kind of brought everything together was in Baltimore. Freddie Gray was taken into custody. And when he arrived at the station, his spine had been severed and his larynx box had been completely collapsed. The claim was that the police had actually given him what's called the rough ride, meaning that when they have a little bit of a tough time with somebody taking them in, they oftentimes will put them into the back of their car and they don't provide the seatbelt to them. And then they'll stop the car with a hard, hard stop in order to try and make it really tough on, on somebody so that they won't want to do these kinds of behaviors in the future. Except what happened in this particular case, it appears, is that Freddie Gray, because he wasn't seatbelted in, it banged up against the side of the car so many times that it severed his spine. This eventually led to citywide riots. And it really led into questions about police practices and whether police practices were really warranted. So this leads into then what are our critiques on this? How do we make sense out of all of these things that are taking place? The police issues, the inequalities, and so forth. Well, we have two possibilities that are given. One is the conservative critique today, and this goes back to Booker T. Washington and the argument of self-help. And the argument is this amongst conservatives, whether they are African-American, white conservatives, or people of any type of group that are in, in the conservative camp. The argument is that minorities today are oftentimes engaged in self-destructive behavior. For example, they will oftentimes point to, you know, what, what is the underlying cause that really makes it difficult for a lot of people to succeed in society? And conservatives will oftentimes point to the rise in single parent families. And they'll say, look, all parts of society today are facing this problem. Unfortunately, today, we are seeing more and more of this within the African-American community. There is a rise in single parent families without fathers to 80 percent of black children. Now, why does that matter? Why should we care about that? The reason why it's so important from a conservative viewpoint is this. If you're an, a young African-American male growing up in a tough situation, especially in an urban situation, your mom's doing the best that she can to raise you. But at some point, you need a father figure to teach you how to control your emotions. You need a father figure to tell you to put, put off that short-term desire for long-term types of goals. You need a father figure who you can really look up to as a role model and really understand how to be a strong young man who knows how to take self-responsibility. And so they would argue that the biggest problem here is, is that without those father figures in the home, of course you're going to see amongst young people an increased rate of crime. And the reason why is that there just aren't the role models needed in order to make sure that young people stay in school, do well, and then plan out when they're going to have a family. On the other side is a liberal critique. Liberals would argue that the real big problem here is growing inequalities, that over the last 30 to 40 years, we have seen amongst globalization inequalities, especially in urban areas. More and more jobs have been outsourced. More and more we're seeing people, uh, automation of jobs. We're seeing basically numerous different ways in which jobs are leaving these inner city areas. And who's going to be the first group that's going to be affected by this most? Well, it's probably going to be young black people because already they're facing the effects of 200 years of segregation and inequalities. And now we're going to heap on top of that the lack of really good jobs that give them hope for the future. And then when you add into the fact that what do people do when they're facing poverty? Well, a lot of times they turn to a lot of social pathologies. And a good example of that would be drug problems. And so in that particular case, now the police are put into the situation exacerbating the, the, the problem. I'll give you an example that demonstrates this. A lot of people would like to point to the fact that, hey, you know, police brutality may be a problem, but excessive policing has brought down crime. I mean, if you just look at it, we have seen crime rates in the last two to three decades drop dramatically, and it just so happens that that's around the time when police became more assertive. Except a tiny problem with that argument. Crime rates were already falling before any of those excessive police practices were put into place. In other words, this had much more to do with the end of the, at the, end of the crack epidemic than had anything to do with, with better policing. So what are the conclusions we can draw from this? I think the first major conclusion is to see where the context changed in the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement moved from a rural southern states 
to an urban, urban North state issue. Conservatives today point to the issue of family stability and trying to break government dependence. Liberals point to social inequalities. Our discussion today has become much more complicated. We tend to approach the discussion, I think, today much more from an attitude of whether you're a overt racist or not. And this causes a lot of problems in our attempt to try to discuss these issues. It's very easy for people to take things personally and to feel very quickly that if we're talking about racism, then I must be saying in some way that you don't like an individual because of the group that they belong to. But that's not really the discussion we're having. We're not really having the discussion anymore about who belongs to the KKK and who doesn't. Our argument today has to do with institutional inequalities and the question of whether or not there's implied bias. Do we tend to look at each other in a different way because of the inequalities that we see in society? And in many ways, these are unconscious ways in which we look at it. If you believe that that's true, then the question is, how do we know when we're looking at it in that way? It's very hard to measure. And that's why our discussion has become so complicated today. It's not an overt issue. It's much more of an unconscious implied issue.